We've defined risk as dispersion in potential outcomes. Now, let's talk about why this dispersion arises in the financial markets in the first place. So in this video, I'll offer a few definitions and then I'll give you a simple framework for thinking about these sources of risk. In a prior video, we established the stock market as a risky asset. We thought of a simple world in which there were, we thought about a simple world in which there were three possible tomorrows and the stock market would give its owners different payoffs in different versions of this tomorrow. And this is the essence of risk, right? We've got dispersion and potential outcomes on these different versions of tomorrow. Now let's go to some actual data. So the S&P 500, or the Standard & Poor's 500, is one of many real-world representations of the stock market. By literal definition, the S&P 500 is a stock index. It's a value-weighted index based on 500 large United States publicly traded firms. This means that its level reflects the total value of these component stocks. So an increase in the level of the S&P 500 means the component stocks have increased in value on average, and a decrease in the level of the S&P 500 means the value of these stocks have decreased. So we've got positive returns and negative returns just indicated by changes in the levels of the index. Now we can also think of the S&P 500 as an investment portfolio of these 500 large U.S. stocks. And in that sense, investors can buy the index or buy the stock market by purchasing shares in a mutual fund that holds the 500 S&P stocks with their relative weights in the portfolios based on the stock's relative market values. Many of the large mutual fund companies such as Vanguard or Fidelity offer these S&P 500 index funds. And I would venture to guess that uh, many of you actually have these funds in your portfolios. All right, let's take a look at what's happened recently in the S&P 500. This chart I got from Yahoo Finance and it depicts daily price levels for the S&P 500 index over the past year or so. And so we can quickly make a few observations. First, after the fact, we can observe that the stock market was in fact risky. There were lots of ups and downs, right? So we're moving up and down all the way through here, up and down. All of that volatility is indicative of risk. Second thing we can observe is there's, there was a long general upward trend over much of 2019. And so that was a good year, right? It was a positive return. And then again, we see um, a positive trend over the last couple of months or so, right? But all of that is overshadowed by this, right? We have a massive drop and we have a series of large negative return days, weeks, and months from about late February through near the end of March. Now we all know what this was, right? This is, uh, this is the COVID-19 outbreak. And we see this massive negative return in the stock market that is tightly associated with this COVID-19 outbreak that, that, that basically brought the world's economy to a halt. Now the risk we observe here has a special name. We call it systematic risk. The dispersion we see in the S&P 500, so the extreme up days, the extreme down days, all of this dispersion in outcomes is driven by macroeconomic or systematic events. That is, events that affect the entire system. 
the COVID-19 stuff that we saw in February and March, that's just one example, a very striking example, albeit, but it is just one example, right? COVID-19 affected everyone everywhere. More generally, when we talk about systematic risk, I want you to think about things like GDP growth, employment, political uncertainty, natural disasters, wars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When these events transpire, many individual stock prices are going to move in the same direction. As a consequence, a portfolio of stocks, which is what the S&P 500 is, will move in that same direction as well. After all, the portfolio is just a collection of the individual stocks, right? So if the individual stocks are moving one direction, we expect the entire basket to move as well. Now let's take a closer look at individual stocks. And for this exercise, I'm going to pick two of the components of the S&P 500. Um, and uh, I'll pick Nike and Facebook. Okay. We're going to take these two individual components and look at their charts over the same time period and overlay them over the S&P 500 chart and, and we'll make some, some observations. All right, here they are. Now, again, recall the blue is the S&P 500. The red is Facebook. And the green is Nike. All right, the first thing that we notice is that these systematic price movements in the S&P 500, all of the wiggling in the blue line, that's more or less reflected in both the green line and the red line, right? We see them all sort of moving together, especially during this COVID-19 outbreak. But the other thing we notice here is that there are movements in the green and there are movements in the red that appear unrelated to the S&P 500 or unrelated to the blue. So then we could say that on the one hand, there's systematic movements that show up in individual stocks, but on the other, we see that each stock has some of its dispersion of its own as well. We call this unique dispersion idiosyncratic risk. So our definition here is going to be dispersion in outcomes that's driven by events that are specific to the stock in question. And so by definition, idiosyncratic risk is going to be unrelated to overall macroeconomic events. And it's also unrelated to events specific to other individual stocks. Nike's idiosyncratic risk is truly unique to Nike, right? It's separate from what's going on in the S&P 500, and it is distinct from Facebook as well. When these events transpire in one stock, they tend to be absent in others. So on average, we could have negative events in one stock being offset by either positive or neutral events in others. And that's exactly what tends to happen. And so so when you put Nike and Facebook and 498 other stocks into a portfolio together to form the S&P 500, then idiosyncratic risk of any individual stock is, is drastically reduced, if not completely eliminated. We call this reduction in risk diversification. So because of diversification then, the S&P 500 or the blue line exhibits less risk than any of its individual components. Here's an example of idiosyncratic risk. Now many of you will recall this event from 2019. This is Duke basketball player Zion Williamson's foot. His Nike shoe fell apart during a game on live TV 
and he was injured. Now, this was a really big deal for Nike. So we have these shoe contracts with many professional athletes, especially basketball players. And, and so when something like this happens, right, when someone is wearing a Nike shoe and it just blows up in the middle of action, um, shoe contracts with many professional athletes could, uh, could, could, could break down going forward. In the, in the very least, this could reduce the popularity and demand for Nike shoes. Did this affect Nike's stock price? Absolutely. Here's an intraday chart for the day of and the day after this event. This first little part of the chart is what Nike was doing the day before, then the market closed, then Zion's shoe busted, and then Nike opened the next morning considerably lower. Right, so investors clearly perceived Nike to be worth less after the Zion shoe event than they did before. Now, was Facebook down? No. What about the rest of the S&P? No. The shoe event was specific to Nike. It was idiosyncratic. All right, let's collect some thoughts and contrast individual stocks with portfolios. So as we can see, individual stocks are exposed to both systematic risk and idiosyncratic risk. Nike's price fell in response to both the COVID-19 outbreak this year and Zion Williamson's shoe debacle in 2019. A diversified portfolio, on the other hand, is only exposed to systematic risk. Zion has a shoe incident, affects Nike in one way, something else affects Facebook maybe in a different way at the same time. The S&P 500 clearly fell in response to the COVID-19 outbreak, but it paid no attention whatsoever to Zion's shoe. So what's the moral of the story? Diversification reduces risk. Now there are some clear practical implications here. Any investor can diversify by holding lots of stocks. Anyone can do this. And the advent of the mutual fund makes this possible even for the smallest of investments. So think investments as small as 500 or so dollars. And because it is so easy and simple to diversify, it's sensible to do so because this allows one to um, avoid taking unnecessary idiosyncratic risk. Now going forward, we're going to think about the risk expected return trade-off from the perspective of a diversified investor. And so in future discussions, we're going to try to establish that only systematic risk matters when determining what expected return should be.